so we've we've um, we've sketched a stress strain curve like this for a typical metal, and we know um, we know an equation within the linear elastic region that's before the proportional limit. That's, of course, Hooke's law, sigma equals E times epsilon. But what do we have after plastic deformation? How can we perform calculations after plastic deformation? If, for example, you know, we had a, a something, a, a bolt in the ceiling. Oh, that's a horrendous drawing. <laughs> let's, let's fix that. Let's fix that before I lose my job. Um, so here's... Uh... <laughs> Ooh, that's even worse. Oh, my goodness. Uh, okay, this is this is good. Yeah, that, that's, that's still awful. But there's a, there's a hook. And I don't know. There's something hanging from it. I was going to draw a force so I don't have to draw something else. There's a hook hanging from the ceiling. And you know you apply a force to it, and you want to know well how how much does that that tie? That's what that is. It's pulled in tension. That tensile tie elongate. What's what's its what's its distance? What's its length? And well, you, you can only at this point only do calculations if the force results in a stress that's less than the yield strength. If it's more than that, well, it's plastically deformed. And we we couldn't couldn't deal with it unless we had some kind of a way of describing the uh, shape of the curve after it leaves the linear elastic region. And it's actually um, nice. We actually do have an equation that fits the the curve, uh, but it's it's gonna it's a it, we we can't use engineering stress. We have to use uh, what's called true stress. So that's what I'd like to introduce for you right now. So again, we're going to take a look at a generalized sample here. And the idea, the goal is, of course, that we're going to go to be able to this, uh, you know, calculate and, and really understand uh, plastic deformation. Uh, so there's our sample with its initial cross-sectional area, as we've discussed before. And we said, well, it, when you load it, it gets longer and gets narrower. And it's that reduction in um, in the cross-sectional area that we're interested in, because this this area here now is the we could call it instantaneous area, whereas this area, the white one, was the initial area. The initial area was what we started with, but then while the load is applied, so sorry, let me draw the force in. While the load is applied, the cross-sectional area has decreased. So First thing we could do is we could say, all right, well, that means that this material itself is actually experiencing a force over a smaller area. So we could define the true stress as the force over that actual cross-sectional area. This is the true stress. This is the stress that the material itself is actually feeling. Okay, and that subscript I is telling us this is the instantaneous cross-sectional area. Inst instantaneous. Oh, I, should, I can't do more than one thing at, a, at the same time, apparently. Instantaneous. Um, instantaneous. I uh, missed a U. Uh, cross-sectional area. instantaneous cross-sectional area. And I'll show you what the plot would look like in just a moment. We could also do the same thing for the strain, although that's going to be just a little bit, require a little bit more thinking. The, the true strain has to account for the fact that what we're doing is we're applying um, a change in length, right? We're, we're elongating it over a, a, a certain length. And this, so the, the very first little bit of elongation is elongation over L0. But then after that, the elongation is uh, elongation over the 
previous length, which was L0 plus that little delta L. And so if you do that for infinitely small, infinitesimally small changes in length, the way we would write that is we'd have to say, okay, the, the true strain, what we're doing is we're integrating, right? We're integrating those infinitesimally small changes in length, that's dL, by L from um, L0, the, in, the uh, initial length, to the instantaneous length. And so if we do that, you find that you have ln of um, L instantaneous minus length naught, uh, which is L uh, ln of L instantaneous over L naught. Okay, so we have um, another equation there. I'll put a box around that. So this is the true strain. Okay, true strain. And if we take that true stress and we plot it against the true strain, I'll show you what we'll get. Actually, let me do, let me just plot stress and strain, and I'll show you what we've already seen. That is the engineering stress strain curve. And then what I'll do is I'll plot for you after it starts to plastically deform the uh, I ran out of space there the uh, true stress. So this one here continues to increase. It doesn't have that decrease at the UTS. That's the true stress, true strain curve. And this one is, of course, engineering. And the nice thing about this plot is once you've got true stress and true strain, we can actually fit that data quite nicely for most metals with a simple equation. And that is a true stress is equal to this um, coefficient times the true strain raised to the power n. Okay, so that's an equation that fits that true stress, true strain data quite nicely. And what's useful about this is these are constants. That's the um, well, that constant n. I'll just define it for you in a moment. And this k is also a constant. <clears throat> now those are material properties. Right? We can look those up in uh, in, an, in an engineering handbook. So n is called the well. This equation is actually called the strain hardening equation, strain hardening equation. And strain hardening, hardening uh, correlates to, or hardness correlates to strength. So really this is this is a, a equation that's telling us that we're strengthening the material and we've got the strain hardening exponent and the strain hardening coefficient k. 